this afternoon it's a special pleasure to introduce Alex Saragosa to you. He is Professor Emeritus of History in the Department of Ethnic Studies at UC Berkeley. Uh, Professor Saragosa earned his PhD in Latin America and history from the University of uh, California in San Diego and he specialized in the field of modern American sorry, modern Mexican history. Uh, and prior to that, he earned his master's degree at Harvard. Uh, after graduate school, he went on to teach at the University of California at Berkeley. And during that time, he was at one point chair of the Center of Latin American Studies. He also served as director of the University of California Center in Mexico City and he was a founding member of the University of California's U.S.-Mexico Studies Program. He has published widely on Mexican-related topics and was the, uh, the chief editor of a major work entitled Mexico Today, an Encyclopedia of Life in the Republic. Uh, he was born in Madera, California, and uh, tells me that he spent much of his youth working side by side with his um, immigrant parents uh, who were Mexican immigrants and uh, were working in the farms in California. He was introduced to us, uh, I should tell you, by our friends at the uh, World Affairs Council in Sonoma, uh, where by popular demand he has been uh, a speaker on more than one occasion, and so we're very grateful that he would, has agreed to be with us today and to talk to us about some of the current issues in U.S.-Mexican relations. Please join me in welcoming him. Now, I'm going to mess this up for you because I, I don't like to stay stuck behind the lectern. So I'm going to move around a little bit. Um, and uh, first of all, uh, my topic today is based on a course that lasts 15 weeks um, for, the, for the only class that I teach on U.S.-Mexico relations, at least it's six weeks. And Judy has asked me to boil this down to 35 minutes maximum. Okay. What does this mean? It means I have to leave out a lot of information, detail, and the like. So um, I'm going to leave a lot of time for questions because that's one way of responding to your particular interests, concerns, and so on. And so please feel free to pepper me with questions. I'm going to try to finish in 30 minutes. But I want to thank Judy for that very generous uh, introduction, and Peter Thorpe, who's going to be my uh, media person, although I have the clicker, and so hopefully that'll work fine. And for those of you in the back, uh, you might want to try to bring your chairs up, because some of the slides, when we showed them earlier, because of the light coming in through the window, they may not be very clear. And for those of you on the side, I apologize, because I don't know about you, but uh, uh, I could never do that trick in The Exorcist of turning my neck all the way around in that regard, uh, sort of thing. So, um, for those of you who are interested in the slideshow and so on, Judy Sloan has my email. Be very happy to send you the slides should you want to see them. Some of them have text. There's no way you're going to be able to read them necessarily. But if you are interested in the text of the slides, etc., then please, I'd be more than happy to send them to you. Uh, they're not copyrighted and this sort of thing. If it appears in one of your books, that's great. Just send me the royalties. <laughs> um, okay, so in my generation, we used to say, okay, let's rock and roll. So that's rock and roll. I know most of you are too young to remember that era. But be that as it may, so let's, let's go forward. Um, and I'll talk over each one of the slides, um, trying to summarize the significance uh, of the slides. Some of them are a little bleached out uh, because of so much light coming into the room. 
Be that as it may, let's go. Three key issues I want to discuss. Trade, immigration, and drugs. Not the kind that I take, but the kind that people take for all the wrong reasons. Um, and a crucial factor in U.S.-Mexico relations now is the domestic politics on both sides of the border. That is, Mexico has a new president. That president reflects a political turn of historic proportions. For reasons, if you like, we can discuss. The old political dominant party is basically dead for the second time. Who knows, it may come back like um, uh, a Freddie on Elm Street or something like that. And the right of center party, um, it has been discredited to a large extent. And the current president is based on a third party, basically a coalition of various groups, progressive, left of center, if you like. But in the case of Mexico, you cannot be re-elected. You can only be elected for a six-year term, which immediately raises the question, how can he deal with these three very complex issues in such a way that it's going to make a real dent on the current situation in Mexico, which is not the best, to put it mildly. In the case of our side of the border, I don't need to tell you, our president is uh, facing the 220 elections, and, uh, and needless to say, I haven't had the opportunity to check my cell phone. Uh, maybe something has happened in the last 30 or 40 minutes that may affect my talk, but we'll see. So, we all know about the polarization here in the United States. Uh, the Democrats don't want to give President Trump an easy victory, even on the question of the revision of NAFTA and this sort of thing, and I suspect Nancy Pelosi will eventually give the green light, but for the moment, uh, she's playing um, a, a kind of mambo, if you will, a Texas two-step, and slowly, gradually moving in that direction. Uh, my sense is that the treaty will be approved. Uh, in the case of Mexico, again, for those of you in the back, uh, this is probably a lot to read, but it summarizes the point that I made earlier about the new president of Mexico, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, otherwise known as AMLO. That's what that stands for. <laughs> the two countries are very different in many different ways. These are just a few of the examples in terms of the size of the population. Mexico basically is much smaller than the United States in that respect. The GDP, as you can see, is very largely different, and much of it has to do with the high poverty in Mexico to this day, despite the statistic on a very low unemployment rate, and a lot of that has to do that in certain cities like Mexico City, 40% of the working age population is in the informal sector. These are the people, for those of you who've been to Mexico, who are selling you the trinkets and the chiclets or whatever it is on the street. They're making orange juice on the street. They're hawking their food on the street and so forth and so on. This is generally true in other cities like Veracruz, Guadalajara, Oaxaca, and the like. But we can come back to that question. In terms of trade for Mexico, the GDP depends very, very much on trade, almost 40%, as opposed to our country where our domestic economy really is the engine as opposed to the case uh, of Mexico. The inequity, the, the inequality between wealth and income, Mexico is third highest. You've got a little, little indication of that wealth in, under very sad conditions when Alejandro Borrio Azcárraga one of the heirs, in a sense, of the dominant television empire in Mexico and so on. Um, I apparently was a little bit tipsy, hit his own son who died. It was in the news. Perhaps some of you saw it and this sort of thing. It's been buried in the case of Mexico uh, in that regard. And our own country is six highest in terms of income and wealth in equity. Uh, this is the signing of NAFTA 2.0 now called Yusmak. I can't say that. I don't know about you folks. 
but the treaty was signed almost immediately in the case of Mexico because this third party that I mentioned earlier uh, dominates the uh, Congress in Mexico, so they passed it right away with the blessing of the current president of Mexico. Canada also signed it fairly quickly. The only country that needs to ratify the treaty is the United States. And as I said earlier, the Democrats are not about to give President Trump an easy pass on this one. These are the states that benefit from uh, the relationship with Mexico. California is on top, um, relatively speaking, and then comes Texas, and there comes Michigan uh, and Illinois. Those are the four top states that benefit with trade with Mexico. If you want, in the Q&A, we can talk about the specifics here. In the case of California, because of the robust character of the California economy, the impact on California is relatively smaller than other states, but in terms of the value of that trade, California is on top. Um, I'm sorry for those of you in the back, this is one of the bleached out slides. We have a, a bit too much light here in the room. The important point is certain states benefit more than others. So if beef exports are important to North Dakota, for example, which is one of the states that's in the darker blue, it's because Mexico now imports a lot of beef that ends up on the plates of a lot of Mexicans, but especially on the plates of people who are in Cancun, who are in Puerto Vallarta, uh, and the like. Uh, these uh, are vehicle exports to the United States from Mexico. It's a major issue uh, in the treaty about trying to lessen uh, the, the amount uh, and magnitude of auto parts and cars made in Mexico sold here in the United States. The assumption being that by cutting that back, this will in a sense bring back some of the jobs in Detroit writ large. Uh, to what extent that will be true will be one of the concluding points that I will make in my talk today. Um, this is what is exported, imported, and so on. For those of you in the back, the light blue is how much U.S. buys from Mexico. You can see a big one is auto parts. Um, most car dealers now, when you look for a new car, it'll tell you what a percentage of the car is made in the United States as opposed to Mexico or other parts of the world. And that's among the reasons why the light blue line under auto parts is so much in the direction of benefiting Mexico uh, as opposed to other uh, things like, say, computer accessories and so on that Mexico buys from the United States. Although a lot of those accessories are made in China, brought in, and then resold, in this case, uh, to Mexico. This is a trade between California and Mexico specifically. Overall, historically, it was always high and continues to be high. A lot of it has to do with certain products, one of them being agriculture. Yeah. We export a lot of stuff to Mexico and they export a lot of stuff to the United States. This is why we can have tomatoes in December and January here in California uh, in our salads. And in the case of Mexicans, they're able to serve uh, things from the United States in Cabo San Lucas, in Puerto Vallarta, in Cancun, depending on the season involved. Uh, this is a more specific graph of the trade between California and Mexico. California is Mexico's largest export market. So when we eat asparagus in December that is fresh, a lot of it is coming from Mexico. 90% of the avocados that have already arrived in the United States now that the season is over in Santa Barbara and, and related areas are coming from Mexico. God's gift to mankind, avocados. <laughs> All right, the ratification process, as I mentioned earlier, I only mentioned two key provisions that are sticking points for the Democrats. Uh, one is worker protections, the concern being that the unions in Mexico have been corrupted. They're very corrupt. Uh, make the Teamsters look like uh, uh, choir boys by comparison. And the concern is whether, in fact, the unionization uh, aspects of labor rights and so on in Mexico will, in fact, be implemented, enacted, recognized, 
and etc. And the second one is environmental concerns. A lot of toxic dumping is being done in Mexico, especially near those industrial plants that are producing goods for the United States, and particularly along the U.S.-Mexico border. But a key provision is to go along with the exports and automobiles, auto parts, and so on, is that 75% of auto parts automobiles must be made in the U.S. Before, it was 62.5% in the NAFTA agreement. Now, it has to be 75% by the year 2023. Keep in mind, though, NAFTA is still um, uh, in operating because the treaty has not been ratified. So a lot of automobile companies are pushing auto production in Mexico right now in order to start uh, to bring in auto, auto parts, automobiles, and so on that are still under NAFTA, which has not been ratified in the United States. All right. Um, but for all intents and purposes, the new treaty is basically cosmetics. There is no substantive difference between the old NAFTA and the new NAFTA 2.0. Uh, the protections, environment, workers' rights, all of those were part of what are called side letters in the original agreement. So there's no big major difference. And whether this difference on the percentage of the car parts, etc., that have to be made in the U.S., again, I'll address that uh, in my concluding remarks. Okay, let's go to drugs. This map is obsolete. It's obsolete as of probably yesterday because the drug cartels are changing and they're changing very rapidly. And through the Q&A, if you like, we can discuss exactly why that is taking place. But what I want to emphasize is where the drugs are coming from. They're coming from various parts of the world, most significantly recently because of fentanyl being now one of the main villains in the so-called opiate crisis and so on, are the illegal labs in China that in the past were doing ephedrine because we greatly reduced the legal importation of ephedrine. So now a lot of it is coming from illegal labs in China and now those same labs now are producing fentanyl. And uh, in, in that sense, the cartels are fighting over territory, the distribution routes, if you will, and that type of violence in Mexico is being replicated here in the United States depending on where are the markets, where territorial rights, if you will, are being contested. In that sense, uh, where I'm at, uh, in the eastern part of Contra Costa County, um, it's taking place in Antioch, for those of you who know that area. It's taking place in Richmond, on the western side of Contra Costa County. It is endemic in certain parts of Los Angeles, and so on. The contest, for reasons that in the Q&A, uh, I hope someone will ask me, why? What is happening? Why is this taking place on both sides of the border? This is uh, a sat graph. Uh, this is a number of overdose deaths. Uh, up to 2017. For those of you in the back, uh, it's going up, and it is a gendered trend, more men than women, but nonetheless, women are also dying because of overdose. More people have been murdered in the first quarter of this new president of Mexico than ever before in the first quarter of the year. So his promise to crack down on the murdering, on the violence, and so on, so far has not worked. His main remedy has been the formation of a national, what we would call National Guard, but to what extent, if any, they're going to be able to avoid the problems of the past, massive forms of bribery and the like, uh, remains to be seen. And right now, it does not look good. These are the overdose deaths in West Virginia because I, we need to understand this is taking place in certain parts of the United States as opposed to others. In the same way that the violence in Mexico 
is also regionally based. Certain states are, in fact, dangerous, whereas other parts of Mexico remain relatively safe for Mexicans and for tourists. This is the overdose chart for California. You can see that this blue one has, has begun to flatten out. The yellow one, which is synthetic opioids, has come up. And the orange line is going up. Because once you get hooked on these, heroin is cheaper. The question is, where is this taking place? What state has the highest rate of overdose deaths per 100,000 population? Well, you can see, and again, for those of you in the back, one of the major areas is in the uh, northwest, uh, pardon me, northeast of the United States, but it's a problem outside of that area. Kentucky has the highest rate of overdose deaths, which immediately leads to the question, what the heck is going on in Kentucky that is creating, one would think, the ghettos of New York or the housing projects of Chicago or something to that effect, but in fact, it's in Kentucky. Uh, maybe the opioid epidemic is lessening. It's plateaued out in 2018. It may be because more and more places, whether it's the state of Kentucky or the state of California, etc., are coming up with treatment programs, outreach programs, and so on, that are finally having some kind of effect. And that may be the reason. We'll find out in January of 2020 whether this trend will continue through this particular year. But it seems that um, it has plateaued. I hope. And it'd be nice if the, if the line was going straight down. So far, not. Um, it is also a racialized trend. You can see that the trend at the top is for non-Hispanic whites. They are the major victims of ODs, overdose deaths by drugs, uh, as opposed to non-Hispanic blacks and Hispanics. In the case of Hispanics, it's pretty flat, relatively speaking. It's gone up in the case of African Americans, but by far uh, it is um, white men and women who are most likely to die from drug overdoses. It is also a regional issue. This is a map of where the cartels are operating. The deeper red, yellow, pardon me, orange, yellow, is where the intensity of the distribution and use and abuse of drugs is taking place, and which area corresponds to a cartel over there in the corner. By far the biggest cartel is the Sinaloa cartel, operating still very well, very effectively, very efficiently, despite the fact that a Chapo is in prison. Uh, however, what this map hides is the proliferation of basically drug games. These are the games that are getting now into other things, if for no other reason, because the cartels can be very violent against any competitors. So in order to avoid, on the one hand, the competition, i.e. getting killed, these drug gangs have um, entered other types of illegal activity. One of the worst is sex trafficking and human trafficking, plus kidnapping, extortion, and the like. Much of the weapons used to kill people in Mexico comes from the United States, depending on whose statistics you look at. It's somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of the weapons used, and these are very sophisticated weapons. Uh, not just your AR-15s, which is basically the M16, but also RPGs, rocket-propelled grenades, grenades, also they're made in the United States, um, uh, high-caliber, 50-caliber machine guns, not to mention the best pistols that Germany can make, sent to the U.S., and then 
distributed from the U.S. by either illegal arms sales or what you and I would call people who have legally bought the guns and so on, but through eBay and other types of internet sales, they are acquired by the drug cartels here in the United States. The banks are very much part of the, of the picture. Billions and billions of men are made in the drug trade. We don't even know how much. If you look at UN statistics versus DEA statistics in terms of estimates of the amount of money, the difference is not 14 million or 140 million or even 400 million. It is 14 billion dollars. In other words, we don't know. We don't know how much money is being made. I can tell you, it's a heck of a lot of money. The banks, the old days where you had mules taking the cash in backpacks across the border, those days are over. At one point, that did happen. But now, it's major banks. And they've all been caught. Whether it's HSBC, whether it's JP Morgan, American Express, etc., uh, Wells Fargo, uh, Washovia, now part of Wells Fargo, and U.S. Bank, etc. All the banks have been caught money laundering. The big ones. Not the Bank of Fresno. Okay. Um, Mexican immigration was a major issue just, what, three or four years ago? Uh, it was a major issue, the 2016 campaign and so on. But in the case of Mexican immigration, it's been going down since the Great Recession. The overwhelming majority of undocumented Mexicans came here to work. So when the Great Recession hit, they went back to Mexico and many of them have not come back. So currently, the major issue is, of course, the migration from Central America, not so much from Mexico. Apprehensions at the U.S.-Mexican border relative to the past, and the, again, those of you in the back, there's light blue. Apprehensions are very high during the administration, especially the first two years of George W. Bush administration. They were relatively high in the Obama administration, some years as high as 800,000 apprehensions at the border, and it's been going down until 2012 and then it flattens out. And one of the reasons it flattens out is that you do have some Mexicans still coming in, but most, uh, most importantly is the increase in migration from Central America and undocumented immigrants from other parts of the world. I'll mention that in just a second. Uh, these are the other people that are coming in undocumented into the United States. Uh, this is data from 2000 to 15. You can see there's more than a three, uh, three-fold uh, increase in the number of Asian undocumented. 60% of the undocumented that have come into the United States in 2010 are visa overstays. All right. So Peggy over here um, flirts with some young guy in Italy and so on and brings him over supposedly to work at her friend's Italian restaurant and then he never goes back. Now I don't know what Peggy did with him but we can all guess. Anyway, the increase is threefold in the case of Central America, Africa, Caribbean, South America. The lowest rate of increase is among Mexican overstays. And by the way, in this group, the one country with the highest rate of visa overstay violations is Canada. <laughs> Canada. Now, I don't know what's going on there in Canada. I suspect some of it has to do with the beautiful people here in California. They visit Pacific Grove, Carmel, Monterey, and so on, and they say, why go back? We don't have men and women like this. I'm staying in Carmel. <laughs> The big issue is what's taking place in Central America. It is an old story. For those of us who specialize in Latin American history, it is no surprise to see the increase in misery 
in Central America. It's been going on at least since the 1930s when the banana trade went down the tubes with the Great Depression, and it's, if anything, has gotten worse ever since then. 95% of the homicides in the Northern tri Triangle countries, Guatemala, Salvador, and Honduras, 95% of them are never solved, 94% are never investigated. This is a homicide rate by country, in the case of the United States, 4.5 versus 108.5 in the case of El Salvador. And keep in mind that El Salvador is the smallest of the three countries with the smallest population. So when you have a homicide rate like that, it's like somebody being killed in Carmel every day over drugs or what have you. This is uh, a violence that is highly urban. It's in the cities. This is where the populations are concentrated in these three countries. And in that respect, in these cities, people die every day. In some cases, multiple murders that are never investigated. And I, I, I do have to say that the highest rate of murders are femicide, that is women who are killed, or young girls. And in the Q&A, you can ask me why that's the case. This is Honduras, and I just use this one slide in my other lectures, in my 15-week lecture, we go through all the countries. Uh, but, you know, when you have 23% of the population malnourished, when 60% of the population lives on $3 a day or less, you can see why some people want to leave. I don't know what that says about the United States. This is not new. We have done this in the past. Refuse refugees from other parts of the world. None of you remember this, but we did this for many years against Jews who wanted to escape Nazi Germany and we wouldn't let them in. President Truman had to do it by executive order in 1948 because Congress would not pass refugee legislation to allow that would facilitate Jewish entry into the United States. So it, it, we don't want to think that this is a unique moment in American history. I could give other examples, but we'll go on. Uh, this is the population that is in detained. All of you know this from watching the news over the last several months. Uh, two nights ago, Nora McDonnell on CBS Evening News visited again a detention center and this sort of thing. This is nothing new. The question is, what the heck are we going to do with all those kids, in some cases still separated from their parents? Okay, let's go to something else. Um, where is it safe to go in Mexico? Don't go to the states that are in red. Michoacan, that's where the new drug cartel has arisen, the so-called new generation drug cartel. They're the only one currently that is willing to challenge the old Sinaloa cartel run in the past by Chapo Guzman. Um, there are a lot of Americans. Last year, more Americans went to Mexico than ever before. So there are still some places that are popular. Um, in my case, I love to go to San Miguel de Allende. The relationship between men and women is 65% female versus 35% male. And that's why I have started a dating service <laughs> called hotgeezer.com. That's me. Nonetheless, um, you can see in the bright yellow, Baja California is still relatively safe. Uh, Cancun is still relatively safe. That doesn't mean people don't get murdered and so on. But the murder rate in Baja, Cancun, and to a lesser extent, Puerto Vallarta is much lower than it is, say, for Walnut Creek, California. Right. Ahead. This is the current fencing in the border. The dark red are the pedestrian fences intended to limit, and the best of all worlds eliminate, anyone jumping over. The yellow are vehicle fences. These are ones with big um, metal stumps, if you will, 
in order to disallow trucks, pickup trucks, vehicles, getting across the border that way. It doesn't stop pedestrians from jumping over the darn things because they're only about four feet off the ground. Even with the current fencing, still, even with the 175 miles that have recently been budgeted out of the defense budget, it would still leave about a thousand miles of the border unfenced in any way. Which means if you're an enterprising smuggler of human people and so on, you just find a way to get around it. And again, in your Q&A we can discuss why the fences were built the way that they were and so on, as opposed to what they could have been, should have been, depending on your point of view. Um, the new president of Mexico um, is currently very popular, uh, depending on whose polling you look at. Um, his popularity has oscillated between around 65% to over 70%. Big approval rating, the kind of approval rating that any president on this side of the border would love to have, uh, at least in recent memory. Um, he started off extremely popular, over 80%. And gradually it's been going down on certain issues, the one being, being uh, public safety in particular. For our purposes, what's important is, can he solve the problem of corruption, of generating more jobs so that the informal sector will begin to be reduced? Will he be able to deal with the question of the drug cartel? He promised that he would, and my concluding remarks will talk about whether that is possible. Um, he's very popular except on one issue, U.S.-Mexico relations. That's his lowest rate, only 47% approval, that he is handling the relationship with the United States in a positive way. The disapproval is 41%. And as a consequence, this is among the reasons why Mexico caved in so early, so quickly, to the new treaty. And again, for reasons that if, if you uh, ask the question, I'd be happy to attend to. The Mexican public's major concern is not U.S.-Mexico relations, it's public safety. Because every day in Mexico City, Every day in Guadalajara, almost every day in Veracruz, etc., there's a kidnapping. Usually by drug gangs, not necessarily by the cartels. Okay, are the jobs coming back? 70% increase in the use of robotics in auto production since 2010. The country that is using robotics more so than any other is China. So a lot of jobs in China are no longer done with people. They're done by machines. And this is true in India, less true in the United States, true in Japan, but not as much, and then Mexico. This is taking place as we speak. The application of robotics in Mexican auto plants Mexican auto part plants, as well, as well as on this side of the border. So the real Mexican immigrant issue, because I don't think the jobs are going to come back anytime soon based on the new provision of the treaty, assuming it gets ratified, and I think it will, um, is a question of remittances. More money was sent back to Mexico last year than ever before. Around 33 billion dollars. Billion. This is among the reasons why so many Mexicans on this side of the border live in relatively poor conditions despite their income because they're sending so much back to grandma, grandpa, or in many cases mom and dad, or maybe an older brother, an older sister, and so on. In that sense, this kind of money is sent primarily to the poorest parts of Mexico. And in that respect, it has a large impact for poor families to receive those checks 
of $300, $400, whatever it is, but you translate into the current currency in Mexico that on the black market is around 20, 22 pesos to the dollar, this is a big impact. So if there is a crackdown, and there was a point where people were talking about uh, the idea of taxing the money that is being sent back, it went over like a lead balloon, because everyone understands the consequences. If poverty is, not always, but is a fact, if more people migrating, then all you're doing is contributing to another round of people in Mexico thinking the best thing to do is to go back to the United States. This is the number of people removed. The blue line here, are the people that have been removed at the border, sent back. But the red line is the number of people sent back that have been caught. And some of you may recall just, what, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, the number of people in plants in Mississippi being sent back. And at least once a month, sometimes more often, in the local news, especially in the Bay Area and so on, there's a story about a parent who's lived here 15 years, never has done anything bad in 15 years since he or she was 22 and got caught DUI. All their kids are U.S. born and they're going to get deported. Those are the people who are sending a lot of their money back home. So when we deport someone, like that, it makes a big difference on both sides of the border. So, what does this mean? It means that, um, in my opinion, uh, I don't think the new president of Mexico has a lot to work with. The cash cow of the Mexican government always has been oil. Because it's controlled by the government, by the state, that has been the golden goose, if you will, in bribery, embezzlement, and so on. Paying off the mayors, paying off the governors, paying off people to go along with the program. And that was true by the dominant party from 1929 until the year 2000. That's when the right of center party, the so-called PAN party, came into power for two consecutive presidential administrations, but they were discredited, mainly because of their failure to deal with the question of violence. And now we have this third party, called the Morena Party, which means dark complected. Not a coincidence, and again, you can ask me why that works, if you will, in Mexico. Uh, but oil production in Mexico has declined, the revenue from oil production as a consequence has declined by almost 70% in the last five years, even with the occasional spike in prices. So the cash cap that would be available to deal with, uh, I should say, to pay for the social programs that have been advocated by the new president, everyone is asking, where is the money coming from? So the new international airport that had begun in the previous administration, he said, no, we got to build it somewhere else. So he wants to build it in the state of Mexico, right next door to Mexico City, if you will. But now that has been suspended. Why? Lack of money. So in the next five and a half years, now even less than that, this new president is supposed to deal with ending the violence, reducing poverty, trying to deal with public safety, i.e. make the cops actually accountable, etc., at all the different levels, federal, state, and local. That's a lot to bite off. But it doesn't look well. On the U.S. side, who knows what's going to happen in 2020. I think President Trump has a viable shot at winning again. I wouldn't write him off. We made the mistake, many of us, by thinking Hillary would win, hands down. She didn't. I don't know what's going to happen with the Democratic Party in terms of their candidate, but the base of President Trump remains very solid. No major cracks. 
Maybe the issue of gun control may make a difference. It supposedly may make a crack in that base, but we shall see. So, in 2020, I am moving to Canada. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was a tour de force, and I'm sure you um, brought about a lot of questions. And I'd like to ask you to wait until the microphone reaches you. I stand you into silence. <laughs> On the drug tech trade uh, graph you had there for a picture, you didn't have stuff coming in from Afghanistan. It said China. Where is... Afghanistan still produces a great deal of drugs, particularly heroin, but on its way to the United States, 88% is absorbed by Europe. So very little comes. So that old movie, The French Connection, if there's a demand, there's going to be a supply. That's what we learned from that movie. So yes, we cut off the trek of drugs from Afghanistan to Turkey, from Turkey to Marseille, from Marseille to the rest of Europe. That is no longer the case. Mexican cocaine is the largest source of cocaine in Amsterdam, in Geneva, in Paris, in Madrid. So the Sinaloa cartel is sending drugs to Europe in part because the Afghan war has made over the harvesting of opium poppies and so on more difficult, despite the fact that it's still taking place and still a major source of income for the Taliban, for example. This is the question you told us to ask. Why are more women and girls being, coached, being killed in Central America than anywhere, than, and then in... It, it, two, two, two basic reasons, there's other reasons, but the two basic ones is either they use the killing of someone's mother or someone's wife or someone's daughter to force a business person to pay the drug gang a certain amount of money per week or per month. You kill the businessman who runs the business because very few women, relatively speaking, are running the businesses, then you kill the person who's probably going to be able to maintain the business. The second is sex trafficking. We're going to take one of the daughters, some of you perhaps read the novel, Sophie's Choice, choose which one. Because one of them is coming with us. And if you don't let her go, the 13-year-old, the 12-year-old, and so on, then we're going to kill the other. And if you have more than three daughters, we will take two. And you have to choose which one we're going to kill if you don't cooperate. Next question. Can you tell us what you think about the intermediate uh, interdiction of migrants to the United States by way of obliging them to seek asylum in other countries in Central America? How to put this delicately? It's stupid. <laughs> uh, the Mexican government caved in through the threats of uh, uh, President Trump about the idea of putting higher tariffs on Mexican goods. When you have a country that depends on trade for roughly 40% of its GDP, that is no idle threat. So Mexico did do that. It has deployed uh, much about 60% of this new National Guard at the border to lessen the number of Central American immigrants coming in and the processing of those who want to ask for asylum in Mexico itself. Mexico doesn't have the resources to necessarily digest all of these people that are willing to ask for asylum in Mexico. Uh, and that has, um, how shall I say it? That has infuriated uh, a large number of Mexicans. That's among the reason why that's its lowest category of approval rate in Mexico. It's a, the Mexicans don't think that is the best way to deal with the issue, particularly if you take into account the history, the historical background as to why the situation has become so acute in Honduras, in El Salvador, uh, and in Guatemala. You also suggested we ask you about, is it Morena, the dark skin? Oh, yeah. Name? Please tell us about that. In Mexico, there has always been color prejudice. Nothing new, not even in Canada, apparently. 
Spanish colonial society in Mexico, 400 years of colonialism, was a um, racialized social structure. The lighter complected you were, the closer you were to having parents who were born in Spain, both of them, then that put you up here in that colonial social order. At the very bottom were people who were either African, slaves, or Indians. And the mixing of the two sometimes took place. For 400 years in Mexico, there was a social order based, therefore, on color. And there were basically 16 categories. Those 16 categories were recorded by usually the priests, because all births were controlled by the church. There was no such thing as civil service and so on. Um, as a consequence of that, then over time, color prejudice became a way of marking someone socially. So if you were very dark complected, that immediately told you this person's, how shall I say it, prospects for the future were not very good. Unlike being a graduate student in electrical engineering at Stanford or Cal. Cha-ching! Now, none of us, of course, got married for the purposes of economic enhancement. All of us here, I'm sure, got married, for those of you who are married, out of love. <laughs> Anybody get married that way? No hands? No romantics? Okay, one. All right. Can I see you afterwards? Anyway, uh, but seriously, that's Morena then has a double meaning. I am the president for the people of the bottom of Mexican society. That's how he sold himself as a candidate because he's run three times, twice he lost. The first time, how shall I say, debatable, given the corruption and voting in Mexico and so on. But the third time, he won. And that is his base, are all those poor people in Mexico who are convinced that this man is going to come through on his promises. To what extent that's going to be possible, we shall see. But the start is not a good one. Oh, okay. I, I have uh, two, so you can answer one, the other, or both. Um, first one is, how, how are the uh, uh, all the weapons getting into Mexico? You mentioned eBay, and I didn't know if that was serious or not. Or Are we talking dark web? or I'm just curious how they're getting across the board at such a large All different number. kinds of ways. Okay. Let, let me answer that one right away. Okay. What I mean by eBay is you can sell a, a pistol, a rifle over eBay, you can put it on the website that it's available, and oftentimes, especially in those states, like the one right next door to Mexico, Texas, you can do all these things online legally. Mm -hmm. Now what happens to that weapon once it gets into the hands of your buyer in, say, San Antonio, the seller, I have no idea. But if he happens to be someone then who goes to the border, so let's say it's a Beretta pistol, and you put it underneath your seat, and you cross over the border, and you go to a bar, and you make it known that you have a Beretta for sale. That's how it's done. In most cases, though, we're talking about large shipments, several rifles, several pistols, in various ways, get across the border. Just one example. Under the NAFTA agreement, Mexican truckers can take their load into the United States, there's a, um, a 15 mile or so zone, there American truckers then hitch their truck to the trailer carrying who knows what, ceramics, auto parts, whatever it may be, and then they go to Michigan, or they go to Georgia, or Tennessee, etc. So those truckers then, on the way back from the border, on the American side of the border, can easily pick up a load. I'm the customs person at uh, Reynosa. And I say, what do you got in the truck? And the guy has, all he has to do is, I got this. And for a guy that's getting paid the equivalent of $12,000 a year, and you're offering, offering him $15,000 in one envelope? Okay. Go ahead. End of story. Uh, the other 
other way that this is being done is by arms sales overseas. Uh, last year, 6,000 German assault rifles were caught in Mexico. I don't know how many of you know about weapons and so on. Uh, as a vet of the Vietnam War era, it is scary that there is a machine gun using 7.72 millimeter bullets that has a capacity of 750 bullets per minute. Per minute. And it was caught uh, from Veracruz that had already gone into the port. And it was caught along the way. And it was, a, of course, how shall I say it, a big story in Mexico in that regard. The government, of course, tried to take credit for it and so forth and so on. What's scary to me, given your question, is they're going outside of the United States now because they have the money to buy these things that are going for $2,500 a pop. Next question. So the, uh, you mentioned oil production has dropped 70% in the last five years. Revenues have dropped 70%. Revenues. Production, again, depending on the statistics, between 35 and 40% has gone down. That seems significant to me. <laughs> it is hugely significant. I mean, if you're depending to spend the money for these social programs, because right now the New Mexican government said, we're going to start sending money directly to you if you are poor. So some Mexicans are getting checks of $130 a month because they are so darn poor. Well, where is that money going to come from? He's already gotten rid of large numbers of civil service people, among them being consulates. Mexico one time had the largest number of consulates in the United States. Now, in the case of Fresno, and, and uh, in Modesto, they had two consulates. Both have been closed. The San Joaquin Valley now is going to be under the auspices of the consul in Los Angeles, which had three, now they're going to have one. So, yes, you can pair off some of the fat, if you will, in the federal bureaucracy, but how do you pay those people? Primarily from the money coming from oil. Pemex. Pemex. Next question. Over here. Oh, oh, yes. Listening to all of this, uh, it's amazing to me how on earth you amass all this information. <laughs> I mean, how many hours a night do you sleep? <laughs> Judy keeps me up. I won't say how. But thank you. All right. And no notes. No notes. I, I was going to say that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I should have said it. That's what I am. I'm a professional academic. I'm a scholar. Uh, where's Tim Sanders? I'm sure he does the same thing. He could give up here and speak for an hour on physics and keep us transfixed with no notes. Now, maybe half of it is made up. Right? I mean, he could put an equation on the screen and we wouldn't know whether he's right or wrong. My guess is, because he's a Stanford grad, it's 99.9% .9 correct, should he do that at some future time. But it's, it's what I do. This is my research, and when you teach a class for 15 weeks where you can get really deep on all this detail that I've glossed over and so on, for me, this is easy to do in 35, 45 minutes or so. So please, um, I, I appreciate the compliment uh, that you intended to make, but this is what I do if you will. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to explore, or have you explore a little bit more, if you could, this uh, migration from the northern triangle countries of Central America through Mexico into the United States. And uh, I'm not sure in my own mind what is the balance between people who are really just fleeing intolerable, unsafe conditions and want to get away, and people who are seeking opportunity and perhaps family members and others in the United States. I uh, haven't heard about a whole lot of people that are fleeing and wanting to settle in Mexico. Excellent question. I'm glad you yeah. had you, you. So, so the, the question yeah. I have is in many parts of the world when there was a situation like this, the UN would come in and set up a refugee camp and people would be in a relatively safe situation, although not in great conditions and not able to work in the economy until they could go back home, 
I haven't heard this mentioned at all here. It's, it's happened a lot in Africa, Asia, Turkey, places like that. So are there, what is the motivation of these people? Is it always a mix of the two? And why haven't, haven't anybody or numbers of people like, saying... Why hasn't the UN established a refugee camp at the U.S.-Mexican well, border or at or the border in, between in Guatemala somewhere. and Mexico? And, yes. and are there people who are happy to get out of the three Central American countries and relocate in Mexico? Okay, okay. that takes about a week and a half in my class. <laughs> so you're going to get it in three minutes. We have to understand there's different components to this migration. One, and the one that gets a lot of drama on the television sets and the, and the news and so on, are mothers and children. That's one component. The second component are young men. Young men who have no job prospects, men who don't have much skills. The Honduran uh, slide that I showed, the number of people who graduate from high school and this sort of thing, is minuscule, particularly for males, because they're expected to go to work and this sort of thing, and many of them can't find work viably uh, in, in terms of income and so on. The third component are people who are involved uh, in a situation where the extortion or threats are being made against them and or their families. So that's another component. The last component that is coming in in my opinion, are people who are doing it because they have relatives in the United States. We have a visa category called TPS, Temporary Protected Status. That is intended or is expected to be expired, at least according to the Trump administration, in January of 2020. For one country of the three, December of 2019. Which means if you're going to use a relative to facilitate your being able to get into the United States, because we require sponsorship, you have to show proof that if you cannot find a job, etc., that this person is in a position to support you until you do. The government will not allow you to get on welfare, unemployment, whatever it is, uh, any kind of social. Um, program funded by the federal government. Now states can do that if they wish, cities can do that, most if not. So in that sense, that's the other component, where people are trying to cross the border, get to a family member, either legally or non-legally. Now, for most Central Americans, the best of all worlds is to be able to get asylum. Because that puts you in a totally different category, including the fact that you will be able to gain access to federal monies during a period of what they call resettlement. And it varies, but it can be three to six months. And that means a certain subsidy for housing, et cetera, et cetera. So that last component joins the three others in trying to get across the border. The ones that try to cross illegally, that is, they have no connection to anyone, and you all saw the sad story about the father, the little girl, she's told to stay on that side of the river, he goes back for mom, the little girl is terrified, jumps in the water for daddy, and the current takes her away. Those are the people that are in the worst situation. They have no connection, no connection, and their only hope is to be able to get across and be able to blend in. Uh, the asylum question, it's up to a, 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 what, an administrative court judge. And if that judge decides against you, then you have to go back or find some other means of surviving and so on. The overwhelming majority of the people in these three countries are not trying to migrate because they don't have the means to even get to the border. So, in that sense, these are the people who often are spending, if you will, the last bit of resources that they have to even get to the border. Whether it's in the form of enough clothes, enough food, enough money, whatever it may be. And I strongly recommend the documentary called The Beast, 
And this is about people who hop on the freight trains to get to the border and then try to cross that way. But the asylum seekers, if they can receive asylum, then that is great because immediately it gives you legal status in the United States, get a green card and so on. TPS only allows you to have a work permit and you can work in the United States, but you're not a green card holder, which means you cannot uh, then apply for naturalization five years after you receive your green card and so on. So you have these different streams within this lumping together what we see in, the, in, in on TV of all these different strands within the Central American migration. And um, for many, the main thing is getting here, finding a job, to send money back to mom and dad. And that's why so many of these immigrants are young. Because the assumption is that even if I receive asylum, I have to get work. For someone my age, that's not easy. It's not easy getting a job, maybe as a bagger at Safeway. But for young people, especially now that we have recovered from the recession, God forbid we have another one soon, jobs are proliferating. We have a very low unemployment rate. Young people in this regard, they're no longer the kind of catch-all uh, in terms of jobs. And that's why you see these young men and women trying to cross. But they're all part of these different strands within the Central American migration. And it's gone down in part for two reasons. The perception that being able to get into the United States, the expectation has gone down. The other is, I still want to go, but I don't have the means to go. And therefore, I'm stuck, and i got to deal with the situation here. That is, whether it's in El Salvador, or Guatemala, or Honduras. That's a three-minute answer to a very complicated question. And the UN, the UN could ask the United States, Guatemala, El Salvador, and so on, to establish a UN refugee settlement along, say, the Guatemala and Mexican border. Neither Guatemala or Mexico has asked the United Nations, because the United Nations can't come in and say, we're going to take this 16-acre plot and start a refugee camp here at this border. Both countries have to agree, much less having a refugee camp on the Mexican side of the border along the U.S. We're creating a refugee camp by default on the U.S. side of the border.